Now we present a special tribute to the late Colm Murray, who passed away earlier today. For the next hour or so, Colm reflects on his life in the company of Sean O'Rourke. The programme was recorded in front of an audience at the Aviva Stadium and was first broadcast in January 2012, before the untimely death of his sister Cathy. Colin Murray is an old friend of mine and a much-loved figure in Irish life. We both studied arts in Galway, though our paths never crossed there, but we've been friends and colleagues in broadcasting for many years in RTE. One lovely evening at the Aviva Stadium's Media Centre in Dublin, Colm and I gathered with an audience of about 200 NUI Galway graduates. He didn't so much need to be interviewed as get the occasional prompt, and I was happy just to sit back and marvel at his wit, his wisdom and humanity. It all started in Middle Ireland, in Moat to be precise. Well, you know, Moat was quite an experience to grow up in. But the best description I ever heard given of it, Tom, uh, Sean, was by Tommy Tiernan, the rather manic Meath comedian. He was talking about the Angelus and the effect of the Angelus on Middle Ireland. And he said, Whenever I think of the Angelus and I hear the Angelus, I think of the town of Moat. Because when I was growing up in Meath, he said, no matter where you were at 12 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the day, you stopped when you heard the bells of the Angelus. And by Jesus, this is before the bypass, and by Jesus, he says, no matter where you're coming from, from north, south, east or west, having got through Kilcock and having got through Enfield and having got through Kinnegad, you come down, but when you hit the town of fucking Moat, he says, <laughs> you will stop, he says, for 25 minutes. <laughs> That's why I call Mo, he said, the new Angelus. <laughs> <laughs> so, happily, the bypass has resolved that. But, but you, you had a family business there. Yes, my father, my father was one of those people who, uh, having worked in CIE in Longford, in the, he married, well, I suppose, let me think, he married at age 40. That was regarded as a rather youthful exuberance at the time in Ireland, in, in the late 40s, early 50s. But he had worked with CIE and... Uh, in Longford, and then he set up a travelling shop. You remember the old blue vans going around the country, the travelling shops? And then he started up a, a, a small business on the Athlone Road in, Mo- in Moat, and then he moved down to Church Street and kept the two businesses going, got a BP filling station, and kind of extended it into a news agency filling station. Uh, in other words, potatoes, sugar, everything was done by hand then. I often filled a stone of potatoes, went out, got a gallon of paraffin oil, brought in two bales of briquettes, uh, went in and filled about seven pounds of sugar and came then and cut two fourpenny ice creams before handing out sausages <laughs> and rashes. There was no such thing as E. coli then. Or, or, or <laughs> and you know something, we were all healthier and we never seemed to visit the doctor. You know? What about the rubber gloves? No rubber gloves? No rubber gloves, no rubber gloves. And it was a big, big treat if at the end of the day you got a couple of bull's eyes. We were easily pleased. <laughs> Very good. And uh, so that obviously is where you absorb this capacity, I think, which is a hallmark of your work. Uh, you're a great observer of the human condition. You would have seen all sorts of people coming and going. All sorts of people. Well, I used to tell a story about a fella called Topsy. I used to say, give us Top and Tapney worth of Wobach, Dan. And nobody would know. And I couldn't describe to people. But I, I had a, insofar as I had any talent at all, I, I mixed with a lot of people. I served a lot of people. But Topsy was unique. He slept on a mattress of money. He never washed himself. No shower existed, nor indeed back lavatory or anything like that. He was a dock leaf and thistle man, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and one particular day, he would come in with six months of nails and growth and dirt. And he wanted, have you got a sail bash loaf? And a, and a pound of butter. If you know butter, a bit of dripping will do. He said, like, but you have an ass and cart from him. And one day he wanted to come in for tuppence halfpenny worth of backy or something, tuppence halfpenny worth of snuff. And he was shouting at the ass to stop. And he was going like, oh, I've gotten, gotten. Uh, have you got a tuppence halfpenny worth of Wobach, Stan? <laughs> you see, the, the ass made to run. And Topsy <laughs> stopped. And he asked me for tuppence halfpenny worth of Wobach, Stan. <laughs> so I used to go around the country after selling lads about, uh, you never heard an order for tuppence halfpenny worth of Wobach, Stan. You know? <laughs> so, so it was at that young, uh, impressionable age, I suppose, in your formative years, and we'll talk in more detail uh, uh, on your, uh, about your professional interest, but that's where you first began to know and love the whole business of horses. 
I, I won't say I started out with any innate love for them or any great knowledge, but one particular day, I remember myself and Mary and Catherine, uh, Patricia was too young or not born at the time, we were only about, it was around late 50s, 59, and my father rounded us all up and we were brought away in his then Morris Minor. For many years he had the old red Morris Minor. And we were brought to the Galway races for a day out. Now, not to the inside, but to where a kid would be absolutely happy. You remember the outside, the place where the carnivals, the swings, the roundabouts, the hurdy-gurdies, the chocolates. And all I remember was a sea of faces, a, a wonderful afternoon, radiant and brilliant sun sunshine, and these colours going round Ballybrit track. I could only see the tops of the jockeys' caps. But I just loved the atmosphere, you know, of, of colour and entertainment and... Uh, you know, sheer happiness and enjoyment, and the day seemed to last forever. And then you, go, you used to go to other race meetings as well. Your father was a real racing man. My father was a racing man, and he was friendly with people like uh, Gus Cunningham, who was quite a character. He ran the Gap House. Anybody that knows the town of Moat will know the Gap House. There's a V in the road. The main road, the old Dublin road, goes on to Athlone and Galway. The other road goes out to a beautiful village of Mount Temple, on down to Glasson. Really lovely country. My father came from out that country. Gus Cunningham ran the pub at the... Th he had a great penchant for a bottle of gin. But one thing that I noticed about Gus was, no matter whether he was at home or abroad when he was out, he would always raise a big glass of gin, neat, and he'd say, well, boys, success to temperance. And he'd down it all <laughs> in the one bit, you know. And there was also John Deacon, a cattle dealer, and Peeny Hackett. Uh, Peeny Hackett was a quite, quite a character. Uh, he, he's another story entirely, but... Let's just say, and my father as well, and oftentimes two or three or the four of them would belt off. And as a youngster, I suddenly began going to the likes of Nace, the Phoenix Park, uh, Tremor at holiday meetings, uh, Leperstown, the run of Irish race meetings. But you must remember then, Sean, Saturdays were the big days, not Sundays like now. And, and, and so you're obviously keen and you knew who was who and what was what and so forth and the colours and that. But what about the back wall? Tell us about the back wall. Uh, well, you see, in my mind's eye, I wanted to be a jockey. All through these early years of 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, I, I wanted to be a jockey. And at the back of our storehouse and uh, garage at the back of the house, there was this wall, you know, roughly kind of of the proportions in length of a horse. And at the right height... And I went in and I got an old potato sack and I got, do you remember the old binding sort of twine that you'd have? Not the light stuff, but the real sort of yellowy... Baler twine. Baler twine. That's the stuff, Sean. Baler twine. <laughs> and I'd, I made my stirrups out of the baler twine. I had my saddle with the potato sack. I got the, I got the reins with the baler twine and I put something appropriate on the top of the wall. I then used to leg myself up by getting the chair of the kitchen and I'd kick it away. And then... I must have, when I think of Anthony Mihal, Mulhall and the Canavans and the Lynams and all the people who live beside us, and even my own sisters when they come out gobsmacked with it, I must have looked like somebody in need of psychiatric counselling. But, but as far you, as I was concerned, I was coming up. I won, I, I never seemed to get beaten. And I gather as well there was an early interest in the betting as well, in a small, minor way. In a minor way, I also, when I would, when I would have fulfilled my jockey duties, and on, a, and, and on another racing day, I gathered up my sister Catherine Mary, Tony Mulhall, Jerry Canavan, Ray Canavan, all the keen hands, all the neighbours, a good gang of people and as many of my pals from Station Road as possible, and I was the bookmaker. And they were there, and Jesus, Sean, they had their pennies in their pocket money. They might have three coppers or something like that, but the problem was they didn't know what to bet. So I was coming out and telling them, you should have your penny on that one. And uh, eventually, after about three weeks of this, Jerry Canavan took my sister Catherine aside. He said, is that fella making money at this racket? Because he said, all I know is, he said, for the last three weeks, I've lost every bit of my pocket money, and I haven't got a lollipop. You know? So <laughs> I, think, I think I was scammed on to fairly quickly, so well, you, I, I you, didn't make much. You obviously had a very broad education then uh, in, in the real world before you headed for Galway uh, via the Carmelite College in Moat. Now, it's hard to believe, I think, uh, people listening to you now and observing your work, that actually... I'm told you're quite a shy person when you started off in, in UCG. Uh, well, you see, I'm sure anybody who comes from a small village or a small town, and particularly in the Midlands of Ireland, can understand this. The, by and large, the tradition for people from the town of Moat was to go to um, UCD. For some particular reason, I wanted to go to uh, Galway. I think it was that Galway races experience. It was the West. It was having spent holidays in Spiddle when I was a kid. We were always kind of... I had a love for the West of Ireland, and I, I didn't have the same 
affection for Dublin. In fact, I was a bit afraid of Dublin. I felt I'd be lost in it, you know. And uh, I was doing my leaving cert with a number of pals of mine in the town, including one of my very closest friends, Ray Lynham. He subsequently became a very hugely successful uh, country singer. But the two of us that year had planned that we would go to university together and uh, I, he and I were both mad to go to Galway. Now, that was probably to resume activities after a recent leaving certificate, post-leaving certificate sojourn in an old hotel called the Waldorf Hotel. You might know it. It's now the Spinnaker or something like that. Up oh, out the, there past the out prom, there, out yeah. beside the race course. That oh, hotel sorry, was owned course, by yeah. our local Cannon and Moat, a man by the name of Cannon McGivney. And we got, we, got, we got cheap digs in it for a full week. And we got, shall we say, as David Norris might say, in reference to Plato's symposium, <laughs> we, got, we, got, we got a rather gentle introduction to the ways of adult life. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> on, on, I should stress, on the uh, distaff side. I, I gather as well, Colm, you, you, you spent some time, um, at least you had an early involvement in the theatre in Galway. Yeah, but just to answer your question first there, what happened was Ray Lynham didn't quite hit the bullseye in his targets in the leaving certificate. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, he felt so short of them that he made a song about it that became a subsequent hit. <laughs> And I managed to, uh, this is not to my credit, but at the time you could get into Galway with two honours in your leaving cert. And just by the skin of my teeth, in French and in history, I scraped two honours. And the rest was the most middling, piddling variety of results that you could ever imagine, with a disastrous outcome in maths. I wasn't qualified for the bank, I wasn't qualified for a local authority, I wasn't really qualified for anything except UCG. I, I, I could say, Colm, you know, not referring to anyone in particular, you were not alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, co coming back to Galway, uh, there, was, there was an involvement as well. As, uh, pr presumably you went to the odd lecture, Colm, but you also went to the Tyviark. I did. I went to the odd lecture. Um, I, 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 I went to lectures and I went to... Uh, I used to love the Lit and Deb, and I wasn't an active member of any society because I was too uh, lacking in confidence. You see, this matter, it took me a long time to integrate into college life in an active and participatory sort of way. And that began to happen around the third year. And I was doing French under... Uh, <laughs> there was a professor there at the time. He was Professor MacGillanaw. You might remember him. Professor Ford. Ford, I think, was Freddy, he? Pr Pruncheus MacGillanaw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Freddy, uh, Pruncheus ran a fish factory. But as a sideline, he was our professor of French in, in the U <laughs> UCG. And the one thing about Freddy or Pruncheus was you rarely saw him except for your oral French as part of your degree. And the one thing that I was tipped off about, it, he w now he had the most beautiful French accent, I have to say. And uh, uh, I only heard it in at the, at the oral exam. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but he did have... He did have a penchant for hiring as lectrices, I suppose you could call them, or for a, a assistants, if you like. Uh, very, very uh, beautiful f young French ladies, you know. And one of them was a Mademoiselle Mouton, who was there at the time. And there was another girl called Dominique. And this Mademoiselle Mouton, I remember well, put on a play called Le Bal des Voleurs. And somehow or another, and they must have been absolutely desperate on the night, rather as the NUIG Alumni Association must also be tonight, because, <laughs> because I was drafted in to fill the, the role of Gaston, or the young lover in the thing. And, and I worried, because not only... I had done a bit of acting in the Carmelite, you know, things like Arsenic and Old Lace and The Rising Generation and straightforward sort of old-style English comedy plays, but this was different, and this was in French. But I did it, and there were people in it like uh, David Burke, who subsequently became you know, associated with the Tuam Herald. Yes, his father, Jared, has run it for years. And yes, I think, Gar I, think Gary, I think Gary Ansborough may have been in it as well. I'm trying to think of the people. Uh, and, uh, it, but it was a great experience. And I, I acted for a couple of nights on the Tyviark Theatre and loved it, ab absolutely loved it. Music, Colm, your, your, your first choice. For a choice of music, you talked about my, er my early years in um, UCG from 69 to 72, in my head, I was Rudolf Valentino, but in reality, I came home alone. So, <laughs> for that reason, and for 
a, a certain ruining of the loss of youth and all those missed opportunities, I think I'll go for Leon Redbone, uh, a song called I Want to Be Seduced. <laughs> <laughs> to be seduced Want a woman to take me out to dinner for two Like to see her eyes get moody Flirting with the thought of what flirting ought to do Like to be real cool Let her think about getting rid of me in bed Here's a chat about Magna Carta Puerto Vallarta Something gone to say I'm a dimmer Politely All to slightly If she tried to find my knee But I'm relatively certain I'd compromise if I know me I want to be seduced Want a woman to so then you um, started, obviously, as people would, uh, towards the end of college life, to think about a career. I saw a job uh, on the paper for continuity announcer in RTE. And I just, I always had had an ambition to try news reading, newscasting, or announcer, announcing. And I applied for this. Well, this was a complete shot in the dark. But I wound up applying for it anyway. And the next thing was I was asked would I come for, as hundreds were asked, to come for a voice test. And one thing led to another. I was then interviewed and brought for a second voice test. And then I went on a training course under... I mean, RTE at the time had the most wonderful training department. I mean, there were rigorous women. Who, uh, formidable. Uh, Joe Mulholland is here. He'd know exactly what I'm talking about. These would be f de, de femme formidable. Uh, Bridget Kilfeather and Una Sheehy. They were the two powerhouses of this. And over in the presentation department, you had people of the caliber of Vincent Bradley, Lorna Madigan, and... They were of the highest standards, you know what I mean, in terms of uh, training. And, and the final T. And, and, the, and the final T, of course, yeah. But uh, at the end of this rigorous process, I was offered, um, after various tests and one thing and another, six of us were on the course, and I was offered a full-time staff job as a continuity announcer. So I had to think about it for a while. And eventually I moved in in October of 1978 into RTE. And then you spent a few years doing programs like uh, Hospitals Requests, which was a big popular program, I think, at the time. And, uh, but gradually you felt yourself, I think, drawn towards the newsroom. Well, I was doing continuity, you see, for about five years. And, up, and, and uh, I got called in around 1982 due to uh, absences and summer rosters. Tom Quinn, who was then the news administration manager, contacted me in an emergency one day, and he asked me, would I fill in for a few days on the early morning radio roster? So I wound up doing radio continuity, hospitals requests, and a few early morning duties. And then, it, a year later, Charles Mitchell retired, and that job was boarded, and a number of us inside went for it. I was hoping that the fact that at least my face was known in the newsroom, Wesley Boyd was the boss then, uh, and, and I was interviewed by a panel, and again, this was the same process. And at the cut of long story short, at the end of that particular interview process, I was offered the, that job as newsreader, and I moved from Radio Continuity into uh, the newsroom in 1983 as a newscaster. But at the same time, it did introduce you to somebody who took a great and a close interest in your career, the, a legendary uh, deputy head of news, one Rory O'Connor. He brought you front and centre where sports news on television in the TV news was concerned. Absolutely. You see, I was tremendously friendly with my late great colleague, one of the forces of nature uh, who inhabited RT, the late Veerwin Jones. You, many people here would have known Veer. And he was a wonderful, wonderful colleague and friend and a bullion extrovert larger than life. But Veer had been campaigning way back in early 1989 when Rory was working along with the likes of Dermot Mullane. Uh, Joe was only about coming into the newsroom as the new boss around that time. I think I'm right in saying, Joe, you would have come in 18, 19, late 89 1990. or early 90. 1990. But anyway, Rory was working. And the 6-1 was only up and running at the time. And there was a transition from Wesley Boyd to Joe Mulholland. And there was to be massive transformation in the newsroom in the, in the ensuing years, you know. But uh, Rory had bought into Veer's idea 
of a news uh, sportscasting bulletin. But what I didn't know was that Veer and Rory had been discussing the, uh, the need for a second sportscaster newscaster because Veer was a newscaster, but now he's going to work as a sportscaster. And Veer had sold Rory the notion that he needed a, another body working with him. And suddenly, Rory sauntered down to me one day. He said, Cullum, Cullum, uh, have you a minute? And I said, yes, Rory. Will you come into my office? And the chat went something like this. Now, remember, I was paddling away in the stream, in the midstream or backstream, happy enough as a newscaster, and not being overly extended. And Rory brings me in. He said, you know that Virwin is planning, uh, and myself and Virwin are planning a sports news bulletin. It could be four or five minutes a day into the new sixth one. It will start in September. I said, yes, Rory, I knew all about that. We have been thinking about this, you see, because Virwin cannot possibly do 14 days in a row. So therefore, we need two people. It will be a seven-day fortnight, an alternative shift, but we need another person. And he says, I think you're the man for that job. And I nearly fell out of the chair. I said, Jesus. Virwin Jones was a trained sports journalist. I had come from a continuity background. I wasn't even a fully registered journalist. I was a newscaster in the, in the Don Coburn sense, if you like. And I said, Rory, for Jesus' sake, I said, Veer is a trained sports journalist. I said, I wouldn't know where to begin. Hold on a second, said Rory. He said, you go racing, don't you? I saw you at the car on Derby Day with my wife. I said, I do. You back horses, don't you? I do, Rory. I saw you on an outing in at a golf course. You play golf, don't you? I said, yes, I do, Rory. I play a bit of golf. You go to Cork Park, too. I said, that's how you there once I won the I was on the final. I went to the hurling final. Yes, I did. Rugby, yes, I watch rugby. I like it. And soccer, yes, I know a little bit about it. Not a lot. And athletics, yes, I've watched athletics. So, again, I argued. I mean, I was, I was in, in dread of what he was proposing. So, it was getting heated. And eventually, Rory slammed the table. And he said, listen to me. He said, I'm going to ask you one more time, he said. You play golf, don't you? I said, yes, I do, Roy. You go racing, don't you? You back horses, don't you? You, you, you like GA, and you were at All-Ireland Finals hurling and football. And he says, you know about rugby? Yes, I've watched a bit of rugby. And you know soccer, too? Yes, I do, Roy. Well, he says, fuck you, you'll do, he says. <laughs> because, he says... <laughs> That's a damn sight more than those other whores down the newsroom, he said. <laughs> and with that, he thumped the table. I was dismissed from his office. And a couple of weeks later, I was the first newscaster on the 1989 Sports News, not knowing what to put out for the few minutes I was supposed to do. Colm, I hate to break the train of our conversation, but another piece of music? I was always a great fan of James Joyce's film, The Dead. You know, the story, the short stories, Dubliners. And if I could hear, Sean, because I think it was such a marvellous performance and uh, I just love hearing it at any time, uh, I down tools and I just listen to the voice of Frank Patterson singing The Lass of Ockram. <laughs>
you managed to see quite an amount of the world in the subsequent years. Well, I did because Rory had had asked me would I would I cover you know the famous Italian soccer odyssey of 1990 that would beca- that became known as Italian Novanta. Uh, that particular year in 1990. Now Joe had become our boss at the time, and it was the first year of it. Uh, I, I was our first live uh, Cheltenham uh, from there. You became a man, the newsroom's man at the Olympics and other big... Yes, I, I, like I, that, yes. I, having been the most reluctant uh, sort of inductee, if you like, into the whole area of sports journalism, and having got off to a very shaky start, I kind, of, I kind of got into it slowly, a bit like the UCG years. It would take you time to get up and get going and everything like that. And I covered, I suppose, if I look back at it now, I covered World Cups at Cheltenham's. Every Cheltenham from 1990, bar foot and mouth and bar two years ago when RTE, for purely optical reasons, for reasons of the optics, decided that they wanted to have a visible cutback and they decided they would cut back Cheltenham. And uh, it was a cheap cutback for them, but they were trying to make a point. I understood the game. That was no problem. I worked on the Cheltenham business at home with Tracy Pickett and Brian Leeson, and uh, that was fine. And then I was back to Cheltenham in 2010, last, last year. Which I suppose is a good point at which to ask you about uh, some of the characters you've come across in racing. I mean, okay, you started off as a boy badgering Pat Taff for the autographs and, and others, but y- you've come across some famous characters. I mean, names like Weld and uh, John Ox, you mentioned. Prendergast, uh, that's another famous Yeah, Paddy name. Prendergast. Paddy Prendergast was a wonderful, wonderful trainer based on the Curra. Uh, Paddy Prendergast trained tremendous winners in places like Royal Ascot, particularly in Chester, Epsom, the Curra, uh, in these islands and abroad, you know, in, in, in France and, and places like that. There's one particularly, I, if I could lay this on you as a story about him, those of you who are racing people would appreciate it, and it'll probably wear those of you who are not. But it would just give an insight into the world of racing. There was a story told about Paddy Prendergast, more than likely apocryphal, about uh, how... No, so it's okay to tell him. Okay. <laughs> he, he brought... This famous horse, Ard Ross, over in the early 60s for a big race, uh, the Ascot Gold Cup. And the jockey was Ron Hutchinson. And Prendergast went into the ring, and he asked for the stable lad, Jack, to bring Ard Ross over to him. And he was noted taking a little white, you know, like a, a sweet-like thing, and how, n- Ard Ross nuzzled it. And eventually, a couple of stewards who were in the thing, they noticed that Prendergast had gone over and administered this substance to his horse. So they, decide that they, they decided that they'd go back into the steward's room to the steward, the senior steward of the jockey club, the near nonagenarian Lord Norfolk and the Duke of Norfolk, and they reported to him that Prendergast was uh, behaving rather suspiciously and perhaps, uh, you're, my lord, you might go down and have a word with him. So fully be brandied and on his walking sticks, uh, the Duke of Norfolk made his way into things. Um, I say, hello, Prendergast. Um, I'm sorry about this old chap, you know, but a bit of form and a little bit of report we got. But uh, it's, it's been reported to me that um, you were seen there uh, administering uh, a substance to your horse, Ardross, in this way. Ah, yes, yes, my lord, said Paddy Prendergast to him. I'll tell you what that was, he said. Sometimes when I'm at home, he said, and I'm out, I have a few brandies, and maybe I stay out longer than I should, and my wife is very, very cross with me, and she's standing at the door, and we have this thing in Ireland, he said, called silver mints. Here, my lord, would you like one of them? And with that, he gives the Duke of Norfolk a silver mint, and he takes one himself. I take this at home because it's a great sweet, and it covers up the smell of the brandy, and if my wife can't get the smell, I get a good welcome home. If, 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 she, does, if she does get the smell, I get the roller pin over the head. So anyway, oh, the Duke understood, and he says, thank you very much indeed, Brandon. I'm sorry about that, but form and all that, old boy. So eventually Ron Hutchinson came in two minutes later, and Paddy was giving him instructions about how to ride our Ross around this track. And he was saying to him, it's a long race, so for the first mile, I don't want to see you. Way back in 10th, 12th, second mile into five furlongs, move into eighth. Then move into seventh. Then about three furlongs out, I want you in sixth. Coming around the final bend with a couple of furlongs to go, move up into fourth. And when you get into third position, as they straighten up with a furlong and a half to go, give them one crack of the whip. And by Jesus, he says, if anything passes you then, it'll either have to be me or the fucking Duke of Norfolk. (laughs) 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 So, 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 that was the story about Paddy Prandica. 
the Duke little know the, the Duke little knew that even he at 90 would have won the Ascot Gold Cup that day. <laughs> so who would be your who would be your heroes in 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 racing in particular, Colin? Well, I mean, when I was growing up, Pat Taff was my as a, my youthful all-time hero, the iconic jockey. Lester Piggott was another huge hero to me. Vincent O'Brien, the same Paddy Prendergast. Uh, Right now, I have to say, Aidan O'Brien is phenomenal. What he does for racing, what he does for Ireland, and, you know, what he does for employment in terms of the operation that he runs down there, as indeed does the whole racing industry. I think it's not often appreciated, you know, by, by those outside the community that, that the, in terms of uh, environmentally friendly sort of agri-industry, that racing provides a lot of employment dispersed right around the country in rural areas largely, and it's very, very vital to the welfare of these rural economies, you know. Colm, I know from our own conversations that uh, your interest, interests extend far beyond sport, and you take a keen interest, for instance, in politics and the comings and goings and the characters and the, the people, but that's not something that began either yesterday or today. My father worshipped at the altar of De Valera, literally worshipped at the altar. He was active in Fianna Fáil. He was a local Fianna Fáil common chairman, uh, a secretary, if he wasn't that, uh, and he ran for local elections, and he was in the, th in the midst of, all through the 50s and into the early 60s, he was running for, shall we say, in the Athlone Ward of the Westmead County Council. And uh, I grew up in an atmosphere where these Fianna Fáil common meetings were sometimes held in the house, or if not in the courthouse in Moat, they would come up afterwards for tea, and my mother would make sandwiches. And as a result, I got to know a lot of these figures of the day. When I was a kid, I must have been fierce impressionable because all these people made lasting impressions on me, but some of them were remarkable people. I'll just give an example. On one particular general, it's not widely known that in our constituency, when I was a kid growing up through the 50s, the late Erskine Childress, former Uthoran the Heron, he stood in Longford, Westmead. I'm sure there are people here in this room who will remember that. And he was fighting all the time for the last seat. And on a couple of occasions after these late night meetings, uh, Erskine, along with various other uh, common members and party people, would come up and they'd have, they'd have bottles of stout, some of them, not Erskine, pots of tea, sandwiches, up in the, and I remember sitting in our front room off the shop, and I was seven or eight at the time, and Erskine was the Minister for Transport and Power, and he had in his, he had in his hand a lovely brochure. Remember the old brochures they used to bring out years and years ago of Aer Lingus, around the time that there were the first jets or the first, I don't know, Boeing 707s, I forget the model of the plane. But Erskine started telling me all about Aer Lingus and all about the plans he had for expansion. And he said, and he had this lovely pipe in his mouth and he was having a cup of tea and he said to me, call me, he said, have you seen, he said, the wonderful new plane that we've just launched up at Dublin Airport? So he invited me to sit in his, on his lap, echoes of Plato's Symposium, yet again. <laughs> he invited me to sit on his lap and, and have a look at these wonderful pictures. And I was listening to this man from a far country at eight years of age on his lap, gobsmacked looking at And then we turned to a wonderful plane. And that column, he said, through another wisp of beautiful pipe smoke, is a Boeing 707. That has been acquired by the Irish government at great expense and will ply between Heathrow and London, Heathrow in London and Dublin Airport. Now, he said... The future for all of us in Ireland, Column, is air travel. And even though you may not believe it, he said, you too will one day fly in a Boeing 707. <laughs> I looked at this. I looked up at Erskine. I looked down at this again. And I looked back at Erskine as if he was Santa Claus. Because he was telling me that I too would one day fly in one of the... This was like telling me that I would be in outer space in 1959. But Erskine said that, and he asked me to believe him that it would happen, and it would come true. Your affection for and admiration for politicians wasn't confined to those of one particular hue. You, you were somebody who admired, and somebody you interviewed lately in this series, um, Liam Cosgrove. Yes, I, I, I got to know Liam Cosgrove after Punchestown races a good number of years ago. We wound up having a couple of drinks together. My impression of Liam when I was active in politics, which was in the early 70s, uh, I, 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 I thought he was the most dour sort of... Um, reserved, uh, charisma-less type of polity, one of the most that I... And that his public image w was, was, you know, that he was an unpopular Taoiseach and that a lot of people didn't sort of find any resonance with him. When I met him that particular day, I was totally disabused of all my preconceptions about, about him. I, I, 
I had never enjoyed anybody's company as much. I was with him for about two hours. He drank a few jemmies during the case in a few hours, and he told me a few stories about what went on behind the scenes, you know. <laughs> and I was listening to this, and he is, a, he is the most engaging of men. He's 91 years of age, and I became determined when I was working with my great friend, the producer Robbie Irwin, on a recent series that involves sporting people, I said, there's one ambition I want to do, just nail, and that is to get Liam Cosgrove. Now, Liam was just as elusive. It was like trying, as De Valera once said, or as somebody once said about De Valera, it was like trying to pick up mercury on a fork, trying to get, to get uh, Liam. But eventually, after trying and trying, he said, I'll come in, I'll tell you what, you see, I'll come in on Tuesday to have a chat with you, and we'll have a chat about the racing and the show jumping and some of the great old sports characters that we used to know. The only thing he said, Colm, is, I don't like talking about politics. <laughs> and she said, I said to myself, what am I going to talk to him about? But I said, come in anyway, Liam, and we'll have the chat. But when we got him in, he was great, you know. And he, as well, I mean, would have privately, uh, prior and separate from the interview, uh, prior to it, um, would have told you some stories about his particularly good working relationship with the then Taunishta and leader of the Labour Party in the 70s in that government, Brendan Corrish. He told me a story that gobsmacked me, but it made me even more mad about the man that day. He said, he said, it goes back, he says, to 1973. He was giving me a bit of a history lesson. We were what's called, he says, the National Coalition. And Fianna Fáil and Lynch were in power for a while. But at the end of the PR thing, we were elected in, he said. Now, he said, if we had done this in 69... We'd have been in better, you see. But we did it in 73, and we were lucky enough to get in. But he said myself and Corish had to get together to form a government anyway. So he came down to the Fine Gael office, and he arrived about 20 to 2. And we sat down, and I said to him, I locked the door of the office, and I told everybody to wait downstairs. He said, the Labour fellas and my fellas were all downstairs. And we didn't come out till 5 o'clock in the evening. And they came up a few times and they couldn't open the door because I had it locked. And they thought that we were getting stuck into each other about worrying about the government. What they didn't know was that I sat him down and I said to him, what do you want? And he said to me, well, I'm looking to be Minister for Health or uh, was it Social Welfare, Minister for Health and taunched her. Yeah, have it, I said to him. What else do you want? <laughs> well, he says, we have a man, he's a great man. Conor Cruz O'Brien. I think he'd be the man for posts and telegraphs. He has it, says he. <laughs> what else are you after? And it went on like this, and they named, tell me, says Brendan Corish, who do you, and he went through, we have a man from, oh, he's up in, he's up in Louth, he says, great man for all matters military, see. loves goons and all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> Paddy Dunnigan, says he, great man. I think he'd be the man for defence. And then he went on, he said, we have a man down in Limerick now, he says, he's a great man for going in and talking to the school children and talking a bit of Irish. Great man for visiting the Gael Talk. I said to myself, that's my man for minister for the Gael Talk. Tom O'Donnell. Says he. Then we had Peter Barry, a very successful man. Oh, he said, he's the man for transport and power. He told me all this. So he went through, he went through the whole thing and he said to me, we had a great man for Matt Lone as well. Pat Cooney, I knew Paddy Cooney very well, you know, for my own part, a wonderful man, nephew of Sean McKeown. All my mother's side were Sean McKeown supporters, so I knew a lot of the... I knew that Paddy Cooney was a nephew-in-law of Sean McKeown. I had great admiration. Paddy Cooney was a wonderful TD. And he said, great legal brain. And I said, of course, I said, that's my man for justice. And he went through the whole thing, and he said, uh, then we had a great man at the Totten in Dublin, says he, you could give him... Now, I make this bit up. He didn't actually say this, but for effect, I say, you could give him any betting slip of a double, treble, or accumulator, and he'd make it up for you like that. A great man at the figures, Richie Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he, he's my man for finance. And eventually, he went all the way around the ring, and he appointed all his various uh, people. And, uh, you know, it, it, he was absolutely wonderful. But anyway, he says, we had all of this business done at about half past two. And Corey said to me, that's great, he says, what will we do now? And I said to him, I'll tell you what we'll do now. And I went over to the cabinet and I had put in there a bottle of jemmy, you see. I'll tell you what we'll do now, Brendan, says I, we'll watch Cheltenham. 
<laughs> and, and I said, I turned on the television and the pair of us got stuck into the bottle of Jemmy and we didn't come out till five o'clock and we found our crowd looking at us and they thought that we were getting stuck into each other and that it was the first breakdown of the new government even before we met. <laughs> Colm, Cheltenham is a, is a running theme um, of, of our conversation and we just keep coming back to it and I think it was around the time of Cheltenham last year that you got some bad news yourself. Yes, I... I, um, I to cut a long story short, I, I had noticed for some months before that uh, I just wasn't walking right. It, it started with a limp. <laughs> it all started with a limp. It's, it's, there's the beginnings of a book there, if you begin it like that. Um, and I remember one particular day, early on, September, October of '09, I had a habit of meeting Robbie, that's Robbie Irwin, our producer, and, and we'd go for a long ramble and a chat down by the Bull Wall, you know, by Royal Dublin, their lovely walk. I live in Tlintarf, so it's very, as the fellow says, contagious to the house. And Robbie said to me one day, you're not keeping up, because he's a fair man to walk at a pace, and I would match him every stride, and we'd go head for head at a fair league. But this particular day, I just couldn't match him. And I said, yeah, Robbie, I said, I have a... I have this bloody limp in my leg. I don't know what it is. And it kept on... Ah, he said, maybe you need a bit of physiotherapy or maybe you should have it checked out and this. And I ignored it for some months, but it was there all the time. It was still there particularly bad one day when I was covering Gordon Park races along with one of our cameramen, Neil Stenahy. And after that, into February, I went to a doctor. He said to me, he did all the t tests, the MOT tests, everything 100%. He said, I don't know. He said, geez, he said, if most patients were getting as clean a bill of health for you as coming in here, maybe you need a bit of physiotherapy. I did two sessions with a physiotherapist, and he said he bent the leg left, right, and center. He was, I was doing everything, and yet I put on my trousers when I was finished and walked out of his place, and, he, and I was walking like a 70-year-old, uh, like a 75-year-old like a, a invalid, you know? So I knew there was something not right. And I was back at work in RTE and everything like that. Now, I won't say I was lying awake at night worrying about this, but I was wondering why this weakness in my leg wouldn't go away. And suddenly in the month of... I told this story before, so forgive me if I'm boring people now with it, but I noticed in the month of February, sometime in mid-February, I began to notice these nerve movements, sort of involuntary nerve move, movements or muscle twitches happening on, on my shoulder, my arms and... Jesus, I said, what's wrong with this? So in my own tin pan, gobshite emote way, I put in muscle twitches into a Google search thing. And within minutes, I was reading about muscle twitches can be blah, 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 known as fasciculations, F-A-S-C-I-C-U-L-A-T-I-O-N-S. -I, I spelled that word out, not because this audience here will never have heard of them, but because I had never heard of them and didn't know, and I had to study it to even pronounce it, fasciculations. So I began reading, what are fasciculations? Can be benign, can be this, can be a sign of some involuntary muscle, or can be a sign of an onset of motor neuron disease, otherwise known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or in America known as Lou Gehrig's disease. I started reading, good Jesus, I began to click. The minute I saw a motor neuron, I began clicking. I didn't really know what motor neuron was, or I, I knew enough that I didn't want to know, but I, I began clicking. Jesus, I said to myself, after about 10 minutes of reading this, I don't like what I'm reading here. And I called Joe Stack, my colleague, over. And he just said to me, shut that down and stop being your own doctor. And this, eventually I went to my, he said, go to your doctor now, tomorrow the next day. I was referred quickly, within a few days, to, before Cheltenham, to a consultant neurologist by the name of Ronan Walsh in the Hermitage Clinic. My wife Anne came down with me. He started, uh, I was made walk up and down a straight line, follow things with my eye. He conducted certain tests like that. He told me that I would have to go for an MRI brain scan and a spine scan. I'd have to go for more blood tests. And finally, I would have to come back to him at the end of March for an EMG test. But in the meantime, he said to me, go to Cheltenham because the time factor is not going to make any difference. So I went to Cheltenham in 10. I came back, I did all these tests. I was in dread of this brain scan, spine scan. But everything came up clear. I reported to his office then. And to cut a long story short, he went through everything and he said, all that's clear, clear, clear. And he did this EMG test. So he sat me down and my wife Anne was there. And he said, uh, okay, we've looked at the bloods, everything clear. We looked at this, we looked at the way you've done this, everything clear. Now let's have a look. And he put it up on his computer screen. Here's your brain scan, you see. I couldn't know the difference whether it was gone ape or gone straight because I was looking at this brain I was merely relieved to find that they actually located one of them 
and, and, and he was describing everything in order. Then we look at the spine. He says, you have one disc, a bit worn at the top, but he says, after golf and after, for a guy of 58 years, is not surprising, a bit of wear and tear. But otherwise, he says, you're in great health that way. So therefore, he said, you will ask me, why are you continuing to have these fasciculations? And he said, all I can say to you, Colm, he says, that to me, this morning, the 30th of March, it was a Tuesday, it was known as Doomsday Tuesday because of the bad economic news that happened on the same day, but it was a horrendous morning. To me, he says, you're, you're presenting to me as a patient who's manifesting all the symptoms of motor neuron disease. And he just came out with it like that, and he told me. And I went back to the day that I was reading about my worst fears, and, and it, just, it just hit me like a... Just hit me like a like a sledgehammer, really, you know. And you've had uh, the treatment and the care of uh, people like Professor Hardiman. Yes. In, uh, he he insisted that I needed a second diagnosis. I didn't want to hear about a second diagnosis. I said, he said we have to. He said this is a very difficult condition to diagnose. That's why it has taken a lot of time in your case. But even I. Even if you didn't want a second diagnosis, I am ethically and every other way bound to refer you. And I am bound to refer you, and I'm telling you now, I'm referring you to the top consultant in the country, uh, Professor Orla Hardiman, at Beaumont Hospital. And you will transfer to her from me, and you will become her patient. Because I discovered then, Sean, that this is an important point. I needed a quick appointment. I was so worried my doctor got me that. I was dealing in the private rooms. I was happy enough to pay whatever it was for the consultant and all these things that happened. But when I was uh, in extremis, if it weren't for the public health service and for Dr. Orla Hardiman and her team in Beaumont, available to everybody, I was going to be left stranded because you could not get that level of care in the private sector. You had to go into the mainstream public health service. It's and, and for that, I'm, you know... I, I appreciate the health service. I appreciate what these professionals do. And I know there are hard cases and terrible cases where people are, feel hard done by. But I do feel strongly that they do not get the credit they deserve for all the positive and great, great work they do. Because of the very public nature of your work, Colm, it's been evident to not just yourself and your family, but to literally, I suppose, hundreds of thousands of people, the effect this has been having on you, the, the, the debilitating effect... Um, and yet, you know, you're, you're, you're battling away, you're, you're going to work, you're doing your rosters and so forth. But how uh, do, you find yourself, do you find yourself getting angry about this or how do you deal with it? Well, I would be less than truthful if I, if I said I, I didn't find myself getting angry about it. I went through a very bad period when I said to myself, Jesus, in my private conversations with God, I say, for fuck's sake, God, why did you have to send this deck of cards my way? Why couldn't you make it something decent like heart or stent problem or a touch of good old-fashioned cancer, God between us and all harm, or a car accident or something that you broke your arm or your leg? And I began sort of thinking, why, why this limbo land? Why this dark, unending tunnel? I said, you really have hit the pits now because my understanding of motor neuron was that it was progressive, uh, incurable, and terminal, and I shortened that too, and I threw in an S, you're in the pits, you know what I mean? And uh, I went through a dark period like that, and it took me a long time to pull myself out of it. I thought I would never work again, I thought I would never see a happy day again, I thought I would never go back out for a game of golf again, obviously, you know, the, all these things. I knew my mobility was fast diminishing at an, at an alarming speed. I knew that that 2010 in Cheltenham would be my last ever Cheltenham for RTE that life as I knew it had changed. And it took me a long time to come to terms with that change and with the need to refocus and readjust and kind of recenter myself. Because suddenly I was gone, I was gone from walking around uh, at a Robbie Irwin pace, doing all these shelter numbers, I, I, you know, racing and running as we all do in the newsroom, driving all over the country, doing your story, uh, broadcasting, sports news, whatever. Um, and then you were gone to struggling around on one stick and then you needed two sticks and you knew it was only a while before you needed two crutches and you realised, horror of horrors, that you were going to end up in a wheelchair and how could you continue and how could you be seen? In a and I went through feelings of shame, inadequacy and um, I suppose demoralisation, all these things. And part of the process of refocusing and recentering that I'm speaking about involved me having to force myself to realise that I was still alive, that 
ending up in a wheelchair, even though I had little dreamed it would ever happen to me, is not necessarily the worst thing in life that can happen to you. I began thinking, I could have... Uh, the, so many elderly people have Alzheimer's. I could have had major breathing difficulties. I mean, thank God at the moment, between breathing and speech, uh, I, I'm clear. But I, I do have noticed in recent months, and it got me down again, my arms, my fingers, my hands, the business of computer typing, all that, texting, mobile phoning, eating, knife and fork. I mean, I'm being open and honest about it. That got me down and it depressed me. And I went through another bad period a couple of months ago. I said, how can I go out in public again? How can I meet people for a drink? How can I sit and have a meal? I'm not going to sit and be spoon-fed. All these sort of thoughts went through my head. And then I was up at the hospital the other day. This new trial under Professor Hardiman has started for an unpronounceable drug that offers some, shall we say, uh, hope of staying the progression or delaying the progression of what is a very debilitating and cruel disease, really. And I met this young woman. She was 44. Eleanor was her name. I just won't, for obvious reasons, give her surname. She was a lovely woman from Dunamore in Mid-Cork. She had four children, ranging in age from 17 down to six. And she, too, had been accepted on the trial. And she was at the stage when she was making her way around, like I used to, on one stick, but in a very ungainly way. And I could see that it was only going to be a matter of time that she would need two sticks and then crutches and then a wheelchair. And she talked about her life and how she had changed her car and how she had got an automatic car. Because even though it broke her heart that she could no longer cook for her family, the one thing she wanted to do with the automatic car, despite many offers of help from neighbours, sisters, friends, to bring the kids to school and to collect them, for as long as she is able to do it, she wanted to bring her children to school, she wanted to bring them back again. Her husband, Donald, was a lovely man. And he told me, he said, Colm, he said, and I, it took me a long time to do that interview on The Late Late Show, but he said to me, we watched you on The Late Late Show that night. All our children ran in and sat down. You were telling our story. And ever since that night, we talk about you, and we love to see you up on that television. We love to see you do your stories. We love to see you presenting. Because if you keep going, we tell ourselves we can keep going. And, you know, this meant a lot to me. Now, now I, 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 I thought about her, and I said, my God, you know, when I'm in this poor me, weepy, weepy situation, I said, I could have got this when I was 36. I could have got it when I was 42. Like Eleanor, I could have got it when I was 44. I would wish that if I had to get it, I could have done a David Niven on it and at least had the decency to wait till I was 78. But that was not to be. But I'm grateful. I tried to turn it into the positives. I could start going down the hill and I could sock myself into it. But there is no future for me in that. I looked at that woman and I envied her and I wished that she could find a cure. Colm, before we go, one, one last piece of music. What is your choice? I, in so, I'm, you know, insofar as I'm a music aficionado, I have to say, ever since the late 60s, all through the Midlands years, uh, when he frightened me traversing the bogs of Offaly at 12 and 1 and 2 in the morning, the voice of Leonard Cohen has sort of haunted me, the lyrics of Leonard Cohen. You could get a lot of stuff to bring you down in him if you were of that bent. But I look for something to bring me up, and perhaps it's opposite now that the one I'll request of you at this particular juncture is the inimitable and great Leonard Cohen and closing time. <laughs> <laughs>
And that was a tribute to our colleague and friend Colin Murray, who passed away earlier today. The programme was produced by Robbie Irwin.